desperate mother. This is, cannot be happening. This cannot be happening. Her pregnant daughter missing. You don't know if something's wrong with her and the baby. You don't know what's going on. No clues, no leads, no sign of Charlie. Maybe she had passed out. Maybe she was hurt, injured. No one really knew. Frustrated by the police response. And I went in and asked them, is anybody looking? My pregnant daughter is missing. Kimberlyn Scott organizes her own search and rescue team. I have to do this. I have to handle this. Hundreds of volunteers answer her call, braving the dangerous jungle. Kim was the glue and saying, look, this is what we need to do. And Kimberlyn won't stop looking for answers, no matter where it takes her. If she's all right, she's waiting for us to find her. And I just would want her to know that we haven't stopped and we won't stop. Demanding justice for Charlie and for all Hawaiians. But the laws need to be stronger and the citizens need to be protected. For most of us, Maui brings up images of beachside weddings and honeymoons. But for lifelong resident and mother Kimberlyn Scott, this incredible place was also home to a grisly nightmare. A mother's worst fear. Kimberlyn Scott's daughter, Charlie, was missing. Where was she? What had happened to her? The last time Kimberlyn had seen Charlie was on February 9th, 2014, the night they had an impromptu family gathering. We both just said, I love you. And that was it, very anticlimactic. But by the next morning, Kimberlyn's gut instinct that something was wrong kicked in. Charlie didn't show up for their weekly get together. She's supposed to come over, bring her laundry. Like she always. doesn't show. 27 year old Charlie was five months pregnant and single. And as the day wore on without any word from her, Kimberlyn began to worry. I started to think about all the things that could have gone wrong because I'm realizing you don't know if something's wrong with her and the baby. You don't know what's going on. I texted her and I told her, I said, you're starting to worry me. You're kind of freaking me out a little bit. Can you just answer? And nothing happened. I haven't heard from her all day. Something's not right. And Charlie's closest sister, Phaedra, couldn't reach her either. Usually I hear from her throughout the day, so I thought that was kind of weird. Now it was nearing 9 p.m. and close to 24 hours since her family had last seen or heard from Charlie. In a desperate attempt to find her, Kimberlyn rushed to Charlie's house with Phaedra. We pulled in the driveway and her car wasn't there, and I remember looking over at Phaedra, kind of accusatory, like, where's her car? She's like, I don't know, Mom, I don't know. The front door was locked. Then Kimberlyn noticed the window was cracked open and decided to break in. It was really easy to open it and slid out enough to push Fader through. And Your sister climbed in through the window. She climbed in through the window, opened the kitchen door for me. Charlie's dog was inside and agitated. For Kimberlyn, it was a sign that Charlie hadn't been home for a long time. She's left the dog for hours. Well, the way it looked to me, it looked like it had been overnight. It was as if Charlie had disappeared into thin air. And it didn't take long to notice that her other dog, Nala, was also missing. The stillness of Charlie's house only fueled Kimberlyn's fears. Her bathroom was outside of the main house. And so we went out there and broke into that and looked in the bathroom because I thought, oh my god, what if she's, she's hemorrhaging down. in the bathroom or something? because we knew she wasn't in the main part of the house. And we looked there, and there was just nothing. At that point, it was full-blown panic. Charlie was thriving, happy with where she was. There was no reason to think she'd run off. Kimberlyn texted Charlie's good friend, Adam Gaines, to see if he'd heard from her. He rushed over to Charlie's house to join them there. It starts kind of processing, and things start feeling more and more dire, especially because she was pregnant. Adam couldn't help but think of the last time he'd seen Charlie, just a few weeks before. The last time you saw her, what was she, what was she like? I know she was- She was happy. She was happy. Yeah. 
she was getting excited at her first ultrasound, I went with her, you know? And so we got to hear that baby's heartbeat for the first time That's together. That's an amazing you know? moment. It was an amazing moment, yeah. The pregnancy was unexpected. Charlie and her on-again, off-again boyfriend, Stephen Capobianco, had broken up a year before. She didn't have to tell me it was Stephen's. We all knew. Why do you think Charlie was drawn to Stephen? He did have charisma and an interesting, odd, but interesting sense of humor. She told him about being pregnant. He pretty much was like, OK, well, what are you going to do about it? Meaning? I'm sure she thought, like, OK, he doesn't want to be involved. I should he wants to do end, something. And the pregnancy. Yeah. Charlie went with Stephen to Planned Parenthood to discuss terminating the pregnancy. But in the end, Charlie decided not to. He had told her to get an abortion, and he couldn't believe that she wasn't going to do that. He was so angry and negative about her desire to be a mother. She didn't care if he was involved or not involved. Thank you. She wasn't holding him to getting married yeah. and helping her raise this baby. Exactly. Charlie had planned to raise her baby with the support of family and friends. Adam and his wife could not have children, so they had gotten so close that they basically said, oh, we'll all raise this child. It'll be great. On the night Charlie disappeared, she was a few months away from becoming a single mom, and she would need to provide for her newborn. She was working her way through beautician school. I mean, she planned on finishing her hair salon thing, and she had told me, I want to open up my own shop and call it Paws and Claws so that you can bring your dog and get your hair done, and we'll do your dog too. And I was like, oh, this is a great idea. Now, Kimberlyn would give anything to talk to her daughter. No one had seen or heard from Charlie for close to 26 hours. You're thinking, I'm overreacting, and everything's going to be fine, and then you will have made all of this noise, and it'll be for nothing, and Charlie will give me the look. Really, Mom? That's when me and my mom got worried. At that point, we called the police. It's a big decision. That moment when you decide to call the police, you're admitting you need bigger help. Kimberlyn filed a missing persons report. What did the officer say? Um, he just asked some questions, and we stressed to him that she's pregnant and that this is extremely abnormal for her. The officer said, you know, stay calm. Most of these cases end up just fine. You know, they just dropped their phone somewhere. They stayed at a friend's house overnight. In the middle of Kimberlyn's panic, she remembered something critical that might help her track Charlie down. Three days before she went missing, I had talked her into adding to her cell phone this thing called Life360. Life360 is a cell phone app that shows GPS location. The ping coming from Charlie's phone showed her off of an infamously dangerous road, Hana Highway. When I looked at it, I realized, wait, the last ping that has at all come up from her cell phone was at 10.56 PM Sunday night. That meant Charlie had been out there all night and hadn't reached out to anyone for help. Where it had her stopped, it was just in the middle of nowhere. She was about 30 miles from her home. The first thing I thought was, you know, of course, why would she be out there? As soon as I had that thought, I thought, Stephen. Kimberlyn knew that Charlie would still jump if Stephen called and needed something. I told him that I was pretty certain that her ex-boyfriend had something to do with it because there's no other reason for her to drive out there. Did you ask the police officer to go drive out there? We did, and that's what he said he was going to do. And he said, I will also contact the HANA officers and have them take a look along the highway. Officers assured Kimberlyn that they would start looking for Charlie first thing in the morning. But when daylight broke, Kimberlyn couldn't wait another second. She had to go out and look for Charlie herself. I woke up Phaedra and said, let's go. Let's get out of here. Let's hit the road. Why did you get in your car and start driving as fast as you could? Because I couldn't sit. I couldn't sit. That's all I could think is I, ha I have to get out there. I have to look for her. Coming up. Did you see any police 
out there? No, looking? that was one of the most upsetting parts of the whole drive. A confrontation between Kimberlyn and Charlie's ex-boyfriend, Stephen. Did he know how to find Charlie? I said, I want Stephen to stop here. I want to see him, look at him, and hear him tell me what happened. I have to do this. I have to handle this. Charlie Scott was 27 years old and ecstatic when she learned she was pregnant with her first child. That joy was shared by her close friends, sisters, and devoted mother. But then Charlie disappeared, lost somewhere in the lush Maui landscape, and all her mom, Kimberlyn Scott, had to go on was a GPS location from her daughter's phone. Where the cell phone ping was coming from specifically, there is literally nothing there and no reason to pull over there. Kimberlyn and Charlie's sister, Phaedra, were out there searching along the dangerous route. And we stopped at every turn that we could, just yelling, telling her to honk if she was down there. Cars can roll, and because it's bamboo, which is very flexible wood, the car will roll right over the bamboo, and then the bamboo just springs back up, and it hides the vehicle. Hana Highway runs along the coast of Maui and is full of hairpin turns, one-way bridges, and steep drop-offs. We would pick up rocks and throw them into the ravine, hoping that we would hear it hit against a car. We would call for Nala and hope that she would appear out of the jungle. Did you see any police out there? No, really? that was one of the most upsetting parts of the whole drive. Not one police car did we pass on that road that whole five and a half hours. Does that start to make you think, OK, we're going to have to do this ourselves? Absolutely. After searching all day, Kimberlin pulled into the Hana police station on the other side of the island. And I went in and asked them point blank, is anybody looking? My pregnant daughter is missing. I was told that they had driven and they had seen nothing. Increasingly, Kimberlyn felt like she was on her own. Primary detective on this case, he did what he was supposed to do. I can't say that he did anymore, um, but he started putting out flyers. Um, he probably could have stayed more in contact with the family. You know, a woman five months pregnant, I think would have garnered a little more urgency. Maui police detective Nelson Hamilton joined the investigation a few days into the search for Charlie. The circumstances in the case were highly suspicious. If there was any kind of critique, I would say it was probably a slow start on it. They were doing the best they could. Lieutenant Danny Dodds was also assigned to Charlie's case several days into the investigation. Once Hamilton and Dodds got involved, it just felt like a level of professionalism had come on the scene, and there was a cooperation that was going on that had prior to that not existed. While Kimberlin was driving Hana Highway, Maui police followed up on her tip to talk to Charlie's ex-boyfriend. They did contact Stephen Couple Bianco, and I, I believe in, in an effort to find out, you know, where did she go that night? Do you know, did you see her? Was she driving? Was she alone? Stephen had seen her. Seven hours after Kimberlin filed the missing persons report, police talked with him, and he told them that his car had broken down in a remote part of Maui, over three miles past where Charlie's phone had pinged. He said he had reached out to Charlie to ask if she would help him fix the car. He said that she had been with him. They got the car running. They came back, and she was following him, and that was the last time that he had seen her. Stephen told police he lost sight of Charlie's headlights in his rearview mirror. He just said he kind of punched it and took off. He figured she was all right at that point. There was no way to verify that Charlie had been on that road because the ping on her phone never left that one location off the highway. Stephen told officers that he was 100% certain it was her car because the front of it was unique. It was a custom-made grill for her truck that had a skull on it. And at night, the eyes of the skull lit up. I couldn't understand why he wouldn't make sure that she was safe. And to never go back and to check on her, or even to call her, to make sure she got home all right. When you first met Stephen, what did you think of him? I just honestly felt like he never 
showed signs of being in love. Didn't show affection no, for Charlie? No, he wouldn't even take pictures with her. When Kimberlyn heard that Stephen had spoken to police, she demanded that he come over. Kimberlyn wanted to question him herself. And I said, I want Stephen to stop here. I want him to write down this timeline. Like, I want to see him, look at him, and hear him tell me what, what happened. happened. Faced with a mom who would not back down, Stephen showed up, and Kimberlyn insisted that he write down every detail he remembered from that night. What are you asking? Where did you guys go to? When did you see her last? That was the biggest one in my mind. When did you last look at her? Because uh, I remember looking up and seeing her car in my rearview mirror. And I'm like, Stephen, are you sure it was her car? And he goes, Kim, you're the one who got her the skeleton that lights up on the front of her car. And I remember looking at him going, don't talk to me like that. Like, can't, it was just out of context. With yeah. everybody so scared, he's being a smart ass. By now, Charlie had been missing for 48 hours. I just kept thinking, she needs help. She needs help. And it's going to be dark again. And everybody's going to stop looking. While Kimberlyn was interrogating Stephen, Charlie's friends got on social media and created a Find Charlie Scott Facebook page. We made a post saying, hey, you know, we're searching for her. And people were calling. A little more than two days later, in the middle of the night, Kimberlyn got her first big break. Someone had found Charlie's dog, Nala. She was in Nahiku, over 13 miles from where Charlie's phone had last pinged. But there was still no sign of Charlie. There's no way that Charlie would leave without Nala, ever. And I was just getting more and more afraid. When Nala was found, it was, it, it was odd, because it would have meant that the dog traveled quite a distance. The padding on the dog's paws were not damaged. It appeared that it was dropped off. Whoever put Nala out there knew Nala. When you go, OK, so what does all this info mean, and where does it mean we go next? The search area was vast, covering 22 miles long and two miles wide. Resources would, would be one of the issues at the initial beginning of this investigation. It's just there wasn't enough people to conduct a large-scale search. Kimberlyn wasn't satisfied with what she thought was a slow-moving search for her daughter. How did she start organizing search parties? Her main drive was collecting people together and pointing them all in one direction. It was a pretty weird time for me because I realized everybody was looking at me going, what do we do next? And I was like, wow, this is, I have to do this. Like, I, I have to handle this. When Kimberlyn put out the call, hundreds of volunteers responded from all over Maui to search for Charlie. Everybody rallied around this. Hundreds. hundreds. It's amazing how many people on this island came out to try and help find her. The fact that she was pregnant added a sense of urgency, not only for us, but for the entire community. And it was a volunteer who discovered something that would change everything. It just literally felt like things went black around me. Kimberlyn Scott was in a desperate search for her missing daughter. By now, Charlie had been gone for three days. Hundreds of people had responded to Kimberlyn's call for help, and she had pulled together her own search and rescue team. She had also gotten together with Charlie's good friend, Adam Gaines, so they could use social media to spread the word and ask for more help. I got a hit about the vehicle. And a friend said that she had heard at least a, a rumor that her vehicle had been spotted. As night began to creep in, a breakthrough. Kimberlyn got a call from her then husband, Charlie's stepdad. He said, we found her car. We found her car. And I just remember he was crying when he said it. And I, I remember asking him, are you sure it's her car? And he goes, it's her license. It's hers. It's hers. He said it's burnt, it's ruined, it's destroyed. Her vehicle was very far from the cell phone ping. And it was only about 10 miles from Charlie's home. The car was on its side, gutted, 
and charred. I just remember my throat closed and I couldn't really ask him much. I just, it just literally felt like things went black around me. But Kimberlyn did keep going. They immediately contacted the Maui Police Department and shared their heartbreaking lead. Her car is burnt in an area notorious for where stolen cars are dumped. They're stripped and burned. To find the vehicle in the condition that it was in, I think all of our hearts kind of sank in that moment. But there was one piece of reassuring news. I don't think it showed any evidence that she was in the vehicle when it burned. That kind of like ramps up the urgency to, you know, we need to get out and find her. She um, may have stopped along the side of the road, got out for some reason, fell down one of the ravines along the side of the road. There's a part of you that's just going, you got to find a way to be positive about this. Keep going, keep going. You have to encourage more people to come. You have to keep this search going. We're going to find her. We're going to find her. Kim was the glue. Kimberlyn was the glue the that was center. holding us all you know, in place and saying, look, this is what we need to do. Everyone stayed out as late as they possibly could looking for her, possibly injured along the side of the road. No one really knew. As investigators examined the car for evidence, Kimberlyn and Phaedra continued to focus on the other side of the island. The ping from Charlie's cell phone was nearly 20 miles from where her car had just been found. Volunteers had looked where Charlie's phone had pinged and found nothing. Phaedra had a nagging feeling, though, that no one had gone deep enough into the jungle. She believed that the ping was the key to finding her sister. You know, it's just that gut feeling. I just, I had to go see it for myself. I heard people had searched there, but it just felt like I had to go out. With your own eyes yeah. and look. No one was actually searching the right area. Like, I saw where the ping was exactly, and I wanted to go to that exact spot because it was off the road, and it's a pretty accurate app. Phaedra and her friends went out and started searching that area. This was just before sunset. Not populated at all. And the area we're talking about is heavily wooded, rainforest jungle area. I was absolutely worried about her safety. I kind of went down into the bushes and followed the road up a little ways. And that's when I saw a DVD with Twilight on it. A Twilight DVD on the ground? I was very confused. It was, that was something that was in her glove box. It was like a treasure map, pretty much. I found another clue started running towards them. And halfway to them, they said they found something. Charlie's shirt. Mm -hmm. When you see that. Right when I saw that, it clicks. That's what she was wearing. She's not out here running around naked. Right when that happened, I didn't even go up to the clothes. I just, I knew it was hers. And I said, I smelt something. So. Something bad? Yeah, something rotten. And I just ran towards the water. Right when I, my eyes crossed over to the other side of the river, I noticed her blanket. Charlie's blanket. And on the corner, just a little bit of blood. But it was in the water. So a lot had been washed away. It's just an awful thing for a sister to have to find. How do you even process what you're looking at? At that point, I just broke down and I just, I went blank right then. Right when I saw the blanket. No, that's when you fully realize. Fully realize what? I mean, there's. Where is she? This was obviously not a car accident. Someone hid this stuff. I don't want Fader to find her. Like, what if it's her? What if she's right? Coming up. I just remember thinking, this, this is, cannot be happening. This cannot be happening. Now this just got real. This investigation just took a totally different turn.
Kimberlyn Scott was frantically looking for her pregnant daughter, Charlie, organizing searches, running down tips. At the same time, her daughter, Phaedra, had just discovered Charlie's blanket and even more disturbing, Charlie's maternity shirt. It was getting really dark. I got a hold of my mom finally and told her that we had found her clothes. And she said, leave it, but we were already driving. And then they all showed up. They had taken the things and set it on the ground, and it was her skirt. And I remember there were just holes all over the belly. I don't think I breathed right after that and haven't breathed right since then. I went very cold, and, and I just... I just couldn't even really think at that point. You you choked when you said the the skirt. Yeah, you saw holes in the skirt. It was partly that they were all over her belly because, honestly, as soon as I saw that, I th this was the baby. This was the baby, and I knew. I knew. I think that was really the moment that I knew Stephen had something to do with this. Kimberlin called the Maui Police Department to collect Charlie's clothing as evidence. Looking at the skirt, that was chilling. When we looked at that up close. Yeah, I won't forget that. And later that night, Kimberlin confronted Charlie's ex-boyfriend, Stephen Capobianco. I just remember yelling, what did you do? What did you do? Where is she? I just remember thinking this is... This is, cannot be happening. This cannot be happening. The next day, Hawaii News Now aired an interview with Stephen Capobianco. He told reporter Maleka Lincoln, quote, it's undeniable. I'm probably the prime suspect, so they're not going to tell me any details. He was sinking himself every time he opened his mouth. Trying to keep hope alive, Kimberlyn held a press conference with her family. A reporter asked a poignant question. If you could send a message out there for Charlie to hear, what would that be? I think the hardest thing for me as her mother to live with is the idea that somewhere, if she's all right, she's waiting for us to find her. And I just would want her to know that we haven't stopped and we won't stop. While that press conference was going on, the Maui Police Department started searching where Phaedra had found Charlie's maternity clothes. And now we have a focal point to start looking for Charlie because these are items that she was last seen wearing. We're looking for a body, a recovery. It looks like a jungle and it's very slippery and, and there was not a, like a clear path. We had done a kind of a side-by-side -side search from the bridge all the way to the ocean and we kept lining up. Nobody really saw anything unusual. After a full day of searching the area, there was still no sign of Charlie, but a minor mishap would lead investigators to a discovery. So I had actually slipped and I had my sunglasses on the top of my hat. And as we were leaving, I realized that my sunglasses were not on my hat anymore. Two of my guys said, hey, well, let's go find it. An officer did find the glasses, and moments later, he spotted something. He yells over to me and says, hey, uh, LT, there's a, there's a black brow over here, and there's holes in it. And at that point, I, I was kind of in disbelief. We're really going to have to have a detailed search, because obviously, with what we're finding, we're going to have to get on our hands and knees, basically. They went back in, searching with new precision. The officer finds what looks like a jawbone or a piece of a jawbone. And at that point, it really dawned on me that, okay, we're gonna have to look for pieces. Now this just got real. This investigation just took a totally different turn. This was now a homicide investigation. Investigators went back the next morning to search for Charlie's remains. Detective Hamilton examined the scene. I noticed something shining under a leaf on the ground, and it's just partially sticking out. It was a body piercing. It was like barbell style. Charlie had a couple of body piercings. I get down on my hands and knees and start looking. 
more. So we, we blocked that whole area off. Looking closer, Detective Hamilton uncovered several fingernails, another piece of bone, and clumps of red hair that matched the description of Charlie. It was a surreal moment that this is the first time I've ever been involved in an investigation like this, like a murder of this magnitude. They called me and they said, hey, can we get DNA from you? And what's the name of her dentist? And I kind of put two and two together and went, eh, OK, somebody's found at least teeth. And then more information gradually came out. I knew it wasn't a whole body, and I, I knew it wasn't all of her. But I knew it was enough to prove that she was dead. What do you think happened to your daughter? Kimberlyn Scott already knew enough to know her daughter was never coming home again. And nine days after Charlie vanished, she got the official word. We brought the whole family in, and we notified them that we're reclassifying the case to a homicide. But we don't have a body at this point. How do you tell a parent that we found a jawbone, and that's how we're identifying your daughter? And that was uh, another. Oh, that was it. Was a tough one. Do you remember your reaction? You have two minds, you know. At least we know. And then there's what the knowing means. It means that she's gone and. She's never going to walk through that door again. While the Scott family mourned, the Maui Police Department sent the jawbone to a forensic anthropologist for analysis. There was over 22 cut marks on the lower jawbone. Seeing those marks, it, it's unimaginable. I, I really can't even put into words what that feeling is inside. The marks were clear indicators that the intent was to dispose of Charlie's body in fragments. And without a whole body, there was no way to know how Charlie was killed, making it more difficult to prove who was responsible. For police, Stephen Capobianco, Charlie's ex-boyfriend, was the prime suspect. He was the last person to see Charlie that night. And Stephen could have a motive. In an interview with police, he had made it clear that he didn't want Charlie to have his baby. She didn't want to tell me because I've made it kind of clear that like I'm not a big fan of children. I don't interact with children. I don't hate them. I don't like. And I don't kick children away from you. You don't despise kids, but you're just not ready to have yours. Yeah, you know, I don't want to hang out with anything that can't have a conversation with me right now. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time trying to see if I could exclude Stephen as a suspect. I couldn't because there, there was nothing to exonerate him. Before making a move, Maui police needed time to analyze the evidence they had. Five months went by while Kimberlyn tried to cope with her daughter's murder and the fact that the man she believed was responsible was still out there. As detectives built their case, they focused on the maternity skirt and came up with a theory. There were more than 20 incisions in Charlie's skirt. To detectives, it looked like she was violently stabbed. It was overwhelming the first time that we saw that. We looked at that and we knew that baby was targeted by someone who did not want that baby and did not want her around. It was vicious. But a motive isn't enough for an arrest. Instead, detectives focused on Stephen's cell phone records. They revealed that hours before Charlie was reported missing, Stephen was in the area where Charlie's remains were later recovered. He made 15 phone calls to Charlie's phone uh, between about 5.47 in the afternoon to 6.30 that afternoon. So it appeared that he was trying to locate her phone by calling it. We never recovered the phone. We don't know if he actually found it or not. Stephen's cell phone records also showed that he returned to that area at least three times. Stephen went back multiple times after she disappeared prior to the discovery of her clothing and, and uh, what remains we did find. I myself believe that he he um, killed her in the car. He wanted to burn the car to get rid of any kind of DNA evidence. The fire burned very hot, so there was nothing left. 
And for investigators, it was Stephen's own words that did him in. Telling people that he doesn't like children and the fact that just before a disappearance, he has a change of heart, no one believed it. It was just too unbelievable for someone like to him to do a 180 like that. Although it was circumstantial evidence, police now believed they had enough to arrest Stephen Capo Bianco. It was the day Kimberlin had been fighting for. I was at home just waiting for dogs to call us, just waiting. It was very anxious waiting for it to actually occur. Stephen was arrested about five months after Charlie disappeared, charged with second degree murder and arson in the second degree for the burning of Charlie's car. He pleaded not guilty to both. What do you think happened to your daughter? I think that she picked Stephen up and that he lied to her and told her that his car was out there and that he did that because he knew that her phone wouldn't work and there would be nowhere to run and that there would be no one to hear her if she screamed. After Stephen was arrested, Kimberlin sat down with the prosecutor and demanded to know if Stephen would be charged for killing Charlie's unborn baby boy, whom the family had named Joshua. He said he acknowledged that his state doesn't have anything and that that's wrong. Hawaii doesn't have a law yep, that nothing. makes it a crime to kill a fetus. They don't have a law that protects the unborn. So when you heard that, what did that trigger in you? I was furious because, because the only dreams that I have of Charlie, the only time she ever talks to me in them, she asks me for her son. At least 38 states have fetal homicide laws, but Hawaii isn't one of them. Kimberlin channeled her anger into action. That year, alongside a state representative, she proposed a feticide bill in Hawaii. The bill, if passed into law, would create a mandate that a separate criminal charge could be applied for the loss of a fetus. If you want to kill a pregnant woman, this is the place to come. You will not pay a penalty for the death of the child. That's how it literally looks from where we sit. Is... And you're fighting now to change that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. While Kimberlin was fighting for the feticide bill, she was also preparing herself to face Stephen in court. Every time they took him out of the courtroom, all of us would ask him, where is she? Every time. We made a point of making sure he did not leave that courtroom without hearing that question. The smug little look that he had on his face throughout her trial told me everything I need to know about him. What did it tell you? That's an inherently evil human being. Kimberlyn Scott had been through the unimaginable. Her pregnant daughter, Charlie, had been viciously attacked. More than two years later, Stephen Capo Bianco, Charlie's ex-boyfriend and the man Kimberlyn believed was responsible for her murder, was about to go on trial. Were you, were you anxious about it? Were you worried about the trial? Yes, yes, absolutely. For the prosecution, this case would be a challenge. There was only circumstantial evidence. But just days before jury selection was to begin, the prosecution sent new DNA evidence to the defense for review. During the course uh, of the investigation, a pair of blue jeans were found. It looked like it had blood stains on, on one of the legs. They confirmed that the blood was uh, Charlie Scott's blood. These were men's jeans, and they were consistent with the size that Stephen would have worn at the time. The jeans lingered in a lab for months. Once they were returned to Maui PD, they found something in the pocket, something that could definitively tie Stephen to the crime. And there was also a hair that was found in the pocket. The hair tested positive for Stephen Capobianco's DNA. Pretty strong evidence that he wore those pants when she was murdered. But it turned out this new evidence was submitted after a deadline. And now the judge would have to decide if Stephen's hair would be admissible in court. The judge ruled today it can't be used. So now the trial will have to continue with no body or DNA from the only suspect in this case. It was a disappointing blow for the prosecution and to Kimberlin and her family. The smoking gun we had was a hair that they could prove 
beyond reasonable doubt belonged to Stephen. I was so upset about the hair because they couldn't use it. What was it like being in that room, Stephen sitting there? It felt very, very surreal. Honestly, it felt kind of bizarre that <laughs> that we were expected to behave not primitively <laughs> and go rip his face off. Over the next six months, more than 400 pieces of evidence were presented at trial. With only circumstantial evidence, the prosecution painstakingly had to prove the arson and murder charges. And on December 28th, 2016, the jury came back with a verdict. We, the jury in this case, find as follows. As to count one, murder in the second degree, guilty as charged of the offense of murder in the second degree. As to count two, arson in the second degree, guilty as charged of the offense of arson in the second degree. Stephen Capobianco was sentenced to 40 years for Charlie's murder and 10 years for second degree arson. I was just extra horrified by the fact that somebody she loved did this to her. The idea that a stranger did it was better than the idea that she died knowing that the person she loved was doing this to her. You know, I, I don't want to think about the law stuff. I just, how can I get her back? Nothing will bring Phaedra's sister back, but Kimberlyn does everything she can to keep Charlie's memory alive. I'd like her legacy to have some positive angle to it. But for Kimberlyn, collapsing under the weight of that grief simply wasn't an option. She became an unstoppable force, fighting for change for all Hawaiians. And that's what she was doing on the day Stephen Capobianco was convicted. The laws need to be stronger, and the citizens need to be protected. But the feticide bill that Kimberlin fought so hard for did not pass the Hawaii State House and eventually expired in 2017. She's still hopeful that it will pass one day. I mean, you didn't go to law school, right? No. No. Why are you doing it then? It'll happen again. And I don't want another mother in this county, in this community, in this state, who did so much for Charlie to suffer the same things that we have I mean, still to this day, she's helping other people. The families of everyone that's been missing. She's what? the one that they go to, and she's so organized about it. Kimberlyn and Adam used the lessons they had learned in Charlie's case and created Maui's first community search and rescue team. Because of, you know, sort of the, the issues that we saw happening with her case, we realized that this was something that this community needed very badly. When a hiker went missing more than five years after Charlie's death, Kimberlyn once again stepped up to search and mobilize volunteers. It falls on the shoulders of the community, and uh, I know what you guys did for Charlie, and I'm asking you to step up and do it again. Please keep showing up. This is what makes a difference. 17 days later, rescue workers found that missing woman alive. But for Kimberlyn, the hunt for Charlie isn't over. You're still searching. Yeah, it's incomplete. It's totally incomplete. I'm never going to stop. I'm never going to stop searching for her. So I feel like that's the only way I can meet her in the afterlife, if, if there is one, is to be able to tell her that I, I didn't stop. I tried everything I could. For more information about Relentless, visit Oxygen.com.